James, Adam, uh, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Uh, it's great uh, that we can still gather together around Christ, around God's words, both here in, in person and for those joining us online too. Uh, and this morning we are very thankful that we have Joel Higson back with us, uh, who will be continuing his short series in, in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, and we'll also be finding out a little bit more about Joel uh, later in the service too something to look forward to. Well, this morning we're going to begin our service by reading Psalm 146. We're going to read it together. And for some reason, as I read this, I was reminded of something that our four-year-old, Lottie, um, came out with a few months back as we were driving along in the car. You know, there had been quite a lot of talk about Boris Johnson uh, and explaining how him, uh, him being in charge of the country had been making decisions on what we could and could not do during coronavirus. And as we've been discussing this, uh, Lottie pipes up and she says, so there are three people who are in charge. The Queen, Boris Johnson and God. Uh, and in some respects, she's quite right, isn't she? Uh, we here in the UK have leaders appointed to serve us uh, and to lead the nation. Uh, but our leaders are flawed. They'll make some good decisions, uh, they'll make some not so good decisions. And that's the case for all of us. We're all fallen human beings, aren't we? Uh, and we cannot trust mankind, we cannot fully trust them. And uh, that's as the psalmist says, we're going to read in a moment. But you see, our God, our God is the one who's in charge of all things, isn't he? He's sovereign over all, and he is the one we can trust. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He remains faithful forever. Uh, he provides for our every need and he sustains us and he reigns for all eternity. And so we can trust him uh, and we can say hallelujah, praise the Lord. Uh, so please uh, join with me. The words will come up on the screen behind me and we'll say uh, this psalm together. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Well, our, our first song this morning reminds us of the greatest reason we can praise the Lord, the greatest way he has provided for all of us. See, despite us rejecting him, despite us trading truth for a lie, God promised a saviour, who is Jesus, who left his throne in heaven, who descended to earth, to take our sin, to overcome death. And the great hope that we have in verse 3, when we will see him face to face and we will praise him, the Lord, forever. So let us stand and we can uh, hear, we can hum and enjoy the song together. And at home, please do, do join in. Oh, 
seat and uh, we're going to continue as we come to a time of, of prayer and confession uh, and as we we've just sung haven't we Christ our saviour has taken our sin on his shoulders every selfish thought everything we have done that hurts other people every time we've we pushed God away and lived our own way see the sin that deserves God's judgment was paid for by Jesus as he suffered and as he died on the cross. Uh, and when we became Christians, we, we recognize our sinfulness, we recognize our need for Jesus, and we repent. We turn away from that sinful life and look to the cross and we look to Christ in humble recognition that he is the only way we can be saved. And we're adopted into God's family. It's a glorious picture. Uh, and yet, even in salvation, even as those who have been shown the grace of God, we still fail each day. We still reject the one that saved us, and so we continue to repent, and we continue to look to the cross and to Christ. And God, in his grace, forgives us and continues to work in us, uh, growing us and making us more like the people he wants us to be, more like Christ. And so uh, we'll confess together. We'll use the words of the confession, which will come up on the game on the screen uh, behind me. Uh, say together, Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you as we should and serve you as we ought. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. We're to continue now in prayer with the, with the words of the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then Peter will come and continue to lead us. So together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you are the Father of mercies and the God of comfort. We praise you that you comfort us in our affliction. And so we pray for those in our congregation who are facing affliction. We pray you will comfort those for whom this lockdown has increased their feelings of loneliness and separation. Comfort those who are missing family and loved ones. Comfort those who feel overwhelmed with everything they have to do. Comfort those who are afraid and fearful for whatever reason. Comfort those who are grieving the illness or death of loved ones. And comfort those who are sick in body and mind. And we pray that as you comfort us in our afflictions, we may be able to comfort each other with the comfort we have received from you. We do want to give you great thanks for those in our congregation who are so good at keeping in contact with other people in the congregation and who comfort and encourage them with phone calls and messages. And we pray that for those who don't yet know you, that they would come to know your comfort and love. We pray that they would come to see that they are sinners in need of forgiveness and that you have provided that forgiveness in Christ. Help us to hold out the word of truth to those around us and open the eyes of the blind, we pray. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and those in all, and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. As so we're going to pray now for those in authority. Almighty God, we do pray for our Queen Elizabeth. We give thanks that she could attest that the teachings of Christ have served as her inner light. We give thanks for her Christmas message, which was full of uh, allusions to the Christian message. Strengthen her and keep her in her faith. And may it have an influence on her family and, and our nation. We also pray for our government and members of parliament. We pray for all involved in the response to the COVID pandemic. May they make wise, true and timely decisions which are in the best interests of everyone. We pray particularly for our local MP, Tim Farron. Help him in his work and help him to stand up for the truth of Christ crucified. We pray that we may be governed in ways which allow us to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And may our society and country uh, come to know the truth that there is a saviour and one mediator between God and men. And we pray in the name of that mediator, Jesus. Amen. Sovereign Lord of the nations, we pray for our world. We know that this pandemic has had a terrible effect and impact on people in many nations. And so we pray for those who've lost all means of making a living those who are running out of food, those facing sickness and death. We also pray for our Christians and brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted for their faith. We pray for them as they are hated by their communities and the last to receive help, if at all. Strengthen them in their faith. Comfort them in the knowledge that they are secure in Christ, cared for by you. Encourage and protect pastors who lead their flocks and help those organisations which bring help and aid to those people. While facing persecution, we pray that our brothers and sisters in Christ will be willing to tell others of their faith, give them courage to speak even in the hardest of situations, help them to um, pray for and to show love to their communities, even to those who persecute them. We ask this and all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Thanks, Peter. Well, nearly uh, a year ago uh, now, we had our Connect Youth Conference uh, with other partner churches in our area. And one of the songs we sang over that weekend was this next one, um, Jesus, Strong and Kind. Uh, and not long after, 
after that weekend we were in a pandemic and put into lockdown. Um, but you see, the truth of that song remains the same, doesn't it? Whatever situation we're in, you know, it's a great reminder that uh, we, as we recognize we are weak, uh, that we thirst and need to be satisfied. Uh, we go through times of fear and worry. Uh, we can come to Jesus. We don't need to look to anything else, but only Christ who will strengthen us and comfort us uh, and satisfy us in salvation. Uh, so we're going to stand together and we'll listen to this song and, and do join again at home. And uh, as I said at the beginning, we're going to be finding out a little bit more about Joel Hickson, who's speaking for us this morning. Um, and so we've got a video recording of an interview that uh, Peter did earlier in the week. Joel, good to, good to have you with me on Zoom. Um, I, I thought it was great having you on Sunday to um, 
uh, preach for us from 1 Thessalonians. We're looking forward to uh, the rest of the series. But I thought I'd just ask you a few questions so that uh, we could get to know you a, a little bit more. Um, and so my first question, Joel, was, uh, tell us, how did you how did you become uh, a Christian? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. And thanks again for, uh, for having me. Uh, yes, I grew up in a Christian home, which was a, a great blessing. Christian parents who taught me the gospel and must have prayed for me uh, lots as I was growing up, which is a great uh, privilege. But um, as I was growing up, I sort of remember having lots of misunderstandings about the gospel, really, under, uh, thinking that uh, I, I have to do a certain amount of good stuff or the more good that I do than bad uh, will will get me into, into heaven. But uh, I, I prayed and I had lots of Bible knowledge, so I was perhaps uh, like like one of the God fearers in Thessalonica, um, uh, but was baptized at the age of thirteen, uh, and I, I would say that I was a Christian then. I believed uh, the gospel, um, but it wasn't really until I got to university that the gospel actually clicked. I went to university in Lancaster and went along to uh, to Moreland's Church, uh, and the teaching there was just very helpful for where I was at whilst I had all this Bible knowledge swimming around in my head. Uh, what it did is it was very good at putting that in some sort of uh, order and explaining well uh, here's the story of the Bible, here's how David fits Abraham and uh, here are the promises of God and here's how it all uh, fulfills uh, in, in Jesus and it was probably there that the gospel really crystallised uh, for me that it wasn't what I'd do. It wasn't um, about how much I'd done. Uh, it was all about what, what Jesus has done, really. And at that point, uh, I think I really started living for Jesus and have continued since, uh, grown a little bit in understanding battles with sin uh, ongoing, but grown in that conviction that um, I'm a great sinner. Jesus is a great saviour. And that's where you find me today. <laughs> Right, well, that's great news, isn't it? The, the gospel when you when you really understand it and you realise, yeah, it's not down to what we do, but it's what Jesus has done. So, I think I similarly remember doing doing a Bible overview for the first time and somebody explaining how the whole Bible fits together, and it was it was it was kind of really eye opening to think, oh yeah, any dropping, yeah, yes, yeah, all those stories I knew, but um, they they all kind of fit together as one story. But mm -hmm. well, well, now you're obviously working at Par Street as um, an assistant minister there. Um, how did you end up in Christian ministry? Uh, there's a few ways you can say that, isn't it? How did you end up in Christian ministry? I hope you don't mean uh, it would probably be fair to ask that ask that question, wouldn't it? Um, I ended up in ministry. Um, time at university obviously clarified the gospel for me. Um, uh, Moreland's also um, do student conferences uh, every Christmas or they used to be back in back in my day and one that I went to was all about ministry not just um, ministry with a capital M but ministry with a with a small M how we all go about doing ministry in uh, in, in everyday life and essentially what it did was it just explained God's plan for uh, creation and uh, redemption and salvation and God's plan for the world the gospel going out and people becoming saved and uh, and the challenge, uh, the gauntlet that was thrown down at, at the end of that was, well, if that's God's plan, how do you fit into that plan? And uh, yeah, I took that to heart and thought, well, uh, I, I could be a ministry trainee uh, for a year. That would be a good way of spending a year to investigate. Well, how do I fit in with that plan and just be a little bit more equipped for um doing either ministry with a capital M or ministry with a, a, a small M by being a, a good, uh, a bit more thought through church member. So I uh, went up to Carlisle, was a ministry trainee for a year there, did the Northwest Partnerships training course and learned some there, enjoyed that, realised there was a lot more to learn, so carried on for a second year. Uh, then um, towards the end of that second year, they uh, very kindly asked me would, would I mind being the youth children's and families worker at Carlisle Baptist Church and I didn't have anything else to do and it's a great thing to do um, so I, I said yes and one year of that turned into two years turned into uh, into three years uh, and uh, that was fine I, I was under great uh, leadership I was uh, with Peter Walkingshaw who was 
uh, a very uh, good leader and made sure that I didn't make too many mistakes. Um, but I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to be in this for the long term, then I probably best learn how to uh, how to think for myself. So uh, at that point, I decided to go down to uh, to Bible college to really think things through uh, and get some of the tools which would help me to do uh, the job in the long term to be a little bit sharper and more efficient and uh, more thought through in what I was doing. So three years then. Uh, three years down down there uh, and then wanted to come back to the northwest um, where I'd grown up and a place where I knew and loved and knew really needed the gospel uh, and Palm Street Church offered me a job and here I am. Yeah, we're very thankful that Palm Street did that and that you've uh, come up here. Tell, finally just tell I wonder if you could tell us how, how are things at Palm Street and how are people doing with the lockdown and uh, being apart and all of those kind of things how are how are things going? Uh, yeah, I, I think as always, uh, as always, a mixture of blessings and encouragements, isn't it? Um, uh, at, at church, we're we're keeping going, meeting in person for the for the present moment. Um, uh, some uh, blessings and discouragements. Sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, some things which are, are really hard. We I think we're finding the lockdowns tough. It's tough being on live stream we've got lots of church uh, members who are sat at home and and can't really come out and uh, and that's a really hard thing we're not able to do the things that we love and that's a, a, a pain we can't just have a have a chat over over coffee we can't just sing and all, all those things which are really good for us and uh, good for the church uh, so we're yeah we're we're struggling in in that way um but there's also a load of um, uh, encouragements as 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 well. We're still here as a church, uh, in spite of uh, last year. And I know lots of other churches which have uh, struggled uh, a lot more than we have and haven't been able to do the things uh, which we have. So we're we're grateful for the way in which God's uh, kept us and helped us. And uh, we've not seen any conversions in the last year, uh, but we have seen. Uh, one, one or two people engaging with stuff online that wouldn't engage uh, with they'd never come along to a, a church building and it's easier to send someone a link to a service than it is to to get them along uh, so that's a, an encouragement but no um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll see where that goes um, and it's also just a, a great blessing really to see uh, the, the ways in which Christians are loving one another um, I, I got a card through in the post uh, just just today uh, with no other purpose other than to um, uh, from a church member to to encourage myself and Lucy and uh, th that that's been multiplied uh, lots of times um, over, over the last year and hear, hearing how Christians love uh, one another has been one of the great encouragements. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it's great to hear. Well, you're very much in our thoughts and our, our prayers, Amy, and we'll continue to pray for you. We look forward to seeing you um, over these coming weeks for One Thessalonians. Thanks for answering my questions. Well, thanks for that, Joel. It was really helpful and encouraging to, to hear. Um, well, Keith Town is going to bring our, our Bible reading and then Joel's going to come and speak to us. Uh, before I do that, let me just uh, pray. Well, Lord God, we, we thank you that we have, you have given us your words uh, and that by it we can know you and see more of your glorious plan of salvation. Uh, help us now by your spirit as we hear it, as we hear your word, to be changed by it and to be better equipped to love and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Keith. Our first reading is Jeremiah 10, 1 to 10. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by the signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them, for the practices of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest and craftsmen shape it with his chisel. 
They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails, so it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be married because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They cannot do no harm, nor can they do any good. No one is like you, Lord, and you are great. Your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you? Kings of nations, this is your due. Among all wise leaders of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are all senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz, with the craftsmen and goldsmith have made. It is then dressed in blue and purple, all made by skilled workers. For the Lord is their true God. He is a living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. And our second reading is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 to 10. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel come to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know now how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you, are wel you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven and whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Well, you might remember in the area, uh, at the tail end of last summer, some brilliant thunderstorms. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night to a loud clap of thunder, huge forks of lightning stretching out across the sky uh, above us, and the explosive rumble of thunder uh, shaking the very foundations uh, of our house. I do love a good lightning storm. But it's against that backdrop that we can read verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord's message rang out, or it could read, it thundered, it resounded out in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Like one of those giant thunder claps reverberating and echoing off, off the valley walls. This message has rolled out, it's gone out from the Thessalonians. It's a fantastic picture, a fantastic description. Wouldn't we love that to be said about us? That the Lord's message has gone out from us, that our faith has become known in the area. And when you put it like that, well, the question becomes, how did it happen? What is the difference between their faith and mine? What was it that made their faith so strong? Uh, what was it a matter of eating spinach? Like, like Popeye, did they crack open a can and guzzle it down and become super strong and faithful Christians? Well, that might make for an interesting uh, cartoon. If we come to 1 Thessalonians, uh, we'll find that the answer isn't in, in spinach. Uh, really, it's a matter of what their faith is in. Uh, our first heading, what their faith is in. I'm sure Peter will have explained faith uh, to you. Faith is simply trust. It, it's not a mystical thing that some people have uh, and other people don't. Uh, you'll sometimes hear people say, oh, well, I, I wish I had your faith. Uh, the thing is, uh, they do, uh, but their faith is just in, in something else. Uh, perhaps uh, their faith is trusting in the idea that, that, that there is no God as opposed to there is a God. Uh, we, we all trust in something. For example, we're all trusting in something right now as 
Uh, we're sat down on a chair. Uh, we, we all trust a, a bridge as we walk over it. Uh, we trust that it will take our weight. Uh, but you see, there, there's a world of difference between trusting a rather ropey rope bridge uh, and trusting a bridge that is uh, strong and firm and made out of stone. So let's look at what their faith is in. What sort of bridge it is that these Thessalonians are walking on. Uh, in verse 4 it says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. We learn two things uh, in that verse. Uh, firstly, they are loved by God. Uh, secondly, uh, they are chosen by God. And just like we saw last week in verse 3, uh, we saw that love is more than just a feeling. Uh, just as our love labors, uh, so too does God's love. Uh, God has more than just warm feelings for us. He actively and practically cares for them. And crucially, uh, he chose them as well. Huge amounts could be said uh, on that one idea, but uh, allow me just uh, to pick up on how this choice was made. Uh, the language picks up on ideas in the Old Testament of how God had, had chosen Abraham, of how he's chosen Israel to be his people. Uh, in Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8, it explains how that choice got made. It says, uh, the Lord did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. For you were the fewest of all people, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath he swore to his ancestors, to your ancestors, that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. The criteria for being loved and chosen is not like the school playground. Uh, people aren't picked uh, based on how popular they are or uh, how, uh, how skilled they are, who's the best player. Uh, God chose them no, not because they were lovely, but because he is loving. His love isn't like our love. Uh, it's not provisional uh, on another person's loveliness. It's not conditional on what we can do for him. His love for us doesn't wax or wane. Uh, isn't that a comfort when we think about our salvation? Uh, wh when I have doubts over salvation, I need to come back to passages uh, like this one. Uh, it's not because of who I am that I'm saved. It's because of who he is, and particularly what he's promised. Uh, that Their faith isn't in themselves. They're not trusting a bridge that they've made. They're not trusting a bridge of their own construction, but one that God has made for us. Uh, when it comes to the question of trust, can, can I trust this God? Uh, the an answer is emphatically, yes, I can. Uh, th this is a God who keeps his promises. This is a God who always acts towards us in love. This is a solid bridge that we can trust and walk on. And in verse 9, Paul reports how they did just that, how these Thessalonians turned from idols to serve the living and true God. They stopped trusting idols and started trusting God. Uh, if you will, they started walking on a different bridge. Uh, again, Old Testament language is used, language from Jeremiah 10 uh, that we had read earlier on, where it compares idols made of wood and stone to the true God, to the living God, to the eternal king in verse 10. The same contrast is being drawn out here between the living God and by implication between dead idols. Now, it's obvious to us today, isn't it, that the idols of Thessalonica are dead. We scoff at the idea that, that a statue might be able to do anything. Uh, easy to see with 2,000 years of hindsight. Uh, much harder to see in their day. Uh, especially when Mount Olympus, uh, the supposed home of the gods, was visible from their very harbour front. Uh, and just like that, we all need to work hard to spot our own false gods, our own idols, the things which we worship which aren't God as well. Uh, last week we mentioned a few of them, uh, idols of comfort, uh, education, uh, youth, uh, identity. We could mention more, idols of financial security, uh, a healthy diet. Uh, in that person just 
always being there to help us out. Often idols only become clear when uh, they start to fail, when that bridge starts to wobble, uh, when that financial blanket is torn away, when uh, when in spite of eating five a day, we, we still get sick. But they might not just be personal idols. We have quite a few national idols. Uh, dare I say it? Uh, the NHS has been described the nearest thing that the British people have to a national religion. We, we look to the NHS to bring us safely into the new year, but not God. Isn't that telling? Isn't it telling how we're panicking at the NHS becoming overwhelmed? Environmentalism. We look to recycling and renewable, renewable energy as the hope for a better world. It, it, it's a new gospel. Uh, in their place, they're, they're good things. They're very good things. Uh, things that are to be used and to be thankful for. But sometimes these things, whilst fine in their place get blown out of all proportion and become a substitute for God. When we set a trust upon them, when we pile upon them an expectation that they cannot bear, when we expect expect them to save us, expect them to protect us and to keep us safe forever, ultimately, they will let us down. Like, Like very thin ice, if we expect too much from it, then we'll fall through. Because quite simply... They are not God. If you've ever dabbled in online grocery shopping, you'll know the dangers of accepting substitutes. Uh, There's a button that you can click, isn't there? Accept substitutes or not. Uh, I had one friend uh, who tried to buy three cucumbers and was substituted with three courgettes. Uh, He tried to buy a Chinese takeaway for two and he got eight bags of prawn crackers. I can sort of see what they were going for, but it doesn't quite cut it, does it? Uh, Likewise, compared to our God, there are no substitutes. Uh, Our our God is described in verse 9 as the living God, the true God. To unpack that, we'd have to read the entirety of, of the Old Testament, really. But one particular verse that helps us to do it is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 34, where God says, Has any other God ever attempted to go to, to, to a nation and take a nation for himself from amidst the other nations by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, by great deeds of terror? all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. Our God is living. Our God has acted in history to choose a people and call them to himself. Which other God has ever done that? We have the historic accounts of the Exodus to show his great power in doing that with an outstretched arm. But of course he does that in a greater way in Jesus with arms outstretched, this time in a different way, calling a people to himself from out of the nations, from every tribe and tongue and nation, calling a people to himself. As the gospel goes out, it liberates people from the kingdom of Satan, drawing them out from his power. It defeats sins. It changes lives. The gospel is powerful to save. Our God is God. He's alive. And the flip side of that is, well, idols are dead. They can't walk, so why follow them? They can't listen, so why speak to them? They can't eat, so why feed them? They can't save, so why follow them? Accept no substitutes. To return to the question of faith, can you see how the question isn't How strong is my faith? The question we need to ask is, what is your faith in? How strong is the thing that your faith is in? Faith in ourself is shaky. Faith in idols is madness. Our faith is in the God of the Bible, a God who's proven time and time again that we can trust him. 
and that has huge implications for the life of the Thessalonians. So the second thing uh, that I want you to notice, the second heading is what difference does it make? Now we need to be careful here, as always, to point out that these are not ways to be saved. These are evidence that the Thessalonians were saved, that they were chosen and loved by God. Uh, Firstly, joy amid suffering. Verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Of course, that doesn't mean that naturally jolly people are more godly. Uh, It doesn't mean that we have to paste a smile on our face every time that we come to church. It's not even something that we have to summon up by our positive thinking. Joy in the midst of suffering is the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And we're given lots of examples of what it does mean. Uh, Because it says that by doing so, they were imitating Paul and by Jesus. Uh, If we want to know what this looks like, look at Paul, look at Jesus. Uh, So consider for a moment how Paul and Silas suffer in Philippi on their way to Thessalonica. Uh, stripped and beaten with rods, flogged and thrown into a dingy dungeon. How do they respond? Well, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Amidst the most intense of persecutions, the Holy Spirit is there, ministering to them, allowing them to sing hymns to God and even witness to these other prisoners. They find real joy in the midst of hardship. Uh, Another pastor, uh, Sam Storms, I think has helpfully said, joy is not necessarily the absence of suffering. It is the presence of God. Even amidst suffering, we can have joy because we have God. Even when you take everything else away, there is still something to sing about because we still have God. If you spend any amount of time praying for the persecuted church, you you might have picked up on that theme, that even amidst very severe suffering, they still have joy. And what gets me is that they're often very concerned with how they can be praying for us. You might have examples of that even closer to home, even in your church, of brothers and sisters who remain joyful amidst suffering. It's a real encouragement. It ought to be an encouragement to you uh, that you are chosen and loved by God. But it's an encouragement to everyone else as well. In verse 7, their joy amid suffering becomes a model for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. You might not be able to see the purpose to your suffering. And that purpose might not even be for you. The purpose might be to encourage someone else that Jesus is worth it, that Jesus is worth it even going through this. Only in the new creation will we be able to see how all those things were worked by God's hand. And of course, the biggest example of that is is Jesus himself. In John chapter 17, just before Jesus is arrested and executed, he speaks of his joy in the Lord. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still with in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. It seems strange that Jesus should speak of joy just before he's being executed. But then joy isn't necessarily the, the absence of suffering. Joy is the presence of God. Then we come, don't we, to verses 9 and 10 that give us possibly the most detailed description of a conversion in the New Testament. It says, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from that coming wrath. Three elements to that. Firstly, turning. Uh, We've already thought about how we turn from idols, uh, but notice that they turn from idols to serve the living God, the true God. Or it could even say to be a slave to the living God. 
which is a shock, isn't it? It's a surprise that it should say something like that. In one sense, idols are slave masters. They demand our work, our worship, and our money. But in another sense, idols really only exist to serve us. The reason why people bowed down to idols and brought them offerings was essentially to serve themselves, to twist Athena's arm into uh, making my crops fertile, to, to get Ares on my side in a fight, to ask Hermes for success in that business venture. Idols exist to serve me. By serving them, I'm actually serving me. I'm worshipping me. I'm putting myself on the throne at the centre of the universe. I'm making myself into God. Our idol of education is often there to provide me with security or comfort into the future. Our idol of healthy living is so that I will live forever. But I can't do that to the God of the Bible. To say that I believe the God of the Bible and not serve him is to tell a lie. It is to deceive myself. How could my relationship to the true God, to the living God, be anything other than that of service? He's God and I'm not. (laughs) To reverse those roles would be an absolute disaster. Uh, My shoulders can't bear the weight of the entire uh, universe and its governorship. And God can't be anything other than what he is. He can't and he shouldn't lie about himself. Our relationship ought to have that dynamic of creator to creature, of father to son, of master to servant. A Puritan, Cotton Mather, once said, the great design and intention of the office of the Christian preacher is to restore the throne and dominion of God into the souls of men. That's what preaching should be all about. That's what ministry should be all about. That's what evangelism should be all about. Putting God back on the throne in our hearts and our minds. And so it's a very probing question to ask, isn't it? Who do you serve? Do you serve God? Or or in your minds, does he exist to serve you? Do you only praise God when things go your way? Do you only listen to him when he says things that you agree with? Do you only do what he says when it's comfortable to do so? Lastly, though, waiting. Another hugely challenging area, particularly in our fast-paced, I want it now sort of culture. The Christian life is to be characterized by waiting. Worth asking the question, what exactly is it that we are waiting for? feels like we spend lots of our time waiting, waiting to be older, waiting to leave for uni, waiting to pass the exam, waiting for the children to leave home, waiting for the promised land of retirement, waiting for the operation, waiting to be back to normal, waiting to receive the vaccine. We might be waiting for all those things, but as Christians, we're waiting for something bigger. We are waiting in verse 10, For his son from heaven, not wishful thinking, but a certain hope, because he's raised him from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. In a very real way, we are saved already, right now. Christ has died and has risen, and we are alive with him. But there still remains a future day. A day when Jesus will return in judgment and wrath. A day when he will remove anyone who opposes him. A day where he will remove sin and Satan and his agents. And because that day hasn't come yet, there there remains a sense in which we are still to be saved. If we believe in Jesus, then we needn't worry about that day. Uh, Jesus' death will protect us on that day too. If you're not a Christian, you do need to worry about that day and uh, to seek God's forgiveness now. But it's a day that we're still waiting for. The Christian life is about waiting for that day, the day when we'll see our Savior face to face. 
It's not a category I often think about as, as being part of the Christian life. Uh, I've been challenged this last week as, as I minister to people who are, who are struggling, who are suffering. Uh, I really want to fix it for them. I want it to be better uh, now. I really wish that I could make this virus just go away and, and make things better. But I can't. And actually a more helpful answer is to say, wait. Wait for it. Our hope isn't for the here and now. Our hope is in the future. One day the coronavirus will be gone. Because one day every virus will be gone. Death won't be a thing. We won't need ventilators or vaccines or, or, or isolation. And we need to cultivate that discipline of patient waiting for our future hope. Saying, I know things aren't right now. And that is hard. But one day they will be. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. But let's come back again to our question of faith. We, we said at the beginning, faith isn't a matter of spinach. It isn't a matter of screwing up your eyes and trying to believe really hard or hoping really hard. It's a matter of what our faith is in. Our faith is in the living God, in the true God. A bridge that is firm and stable, that has proved itself over thousands of years. God has remained faithful to his people and to his promises. Our faith is not in idols, in lumps of wood. Uh, they too offer bridges, but they're not bridges that you'd want to trust. Like a frayed rope bridge, they sway and snap and will throw us into the water. They are not God. They do not sit on the throne. And if we get that message right, if we get that message square before our eyes, if we realize just how glorious our God is by contrast to these idols, then maybe, just maybe, verse 8 will be true of us as well. The Lord's message will thunder out from us, not only in Cumbria, but in Lancashire. But everywhere in God, our faith will become known to everyone. Let's pray that that would be so. Let's pray. Our, our loving Father, please restore to our hearts your throne and dominion. Please turn us away from idols and turn us back to the living and true God. And we pray that in light of that, your message would thunder out from us into Milnthorpe and the surrounding areas and that our faith would become, become known everywhere. Amen. Well, we're going to continue to encourage one another uh, in those things now uh, as we continue to sing or uh, to enjoy our next song, Behold our God uh, seated on the throne. Come, let us adore him. Uh, let's stand together. Oh, create.
Oh, please do take a seat. And uh, what, what a God we have. You know, it's a God that we can put our trust in, put our faith in, and be certain that he'll be faithful too. Well, um, just before we finish, I've got some uh, Trinity news. Uh, firstly, it's to say uh, that this week will be our first week back to our growth groups formally meeting again. Uh, so do be praying for them, pray for your own group, be praying for others as well as we start a sort of new group dynamic, and sort of praying for those new relationships to be formed as we seek to encourage and build one another up in them. At Trinity Youth as well, we started last week, last Wednesday, but we're going to be meeting again this week on Zoom and we'll be beginning our, our study in Romans uh, in that group too. So we're praying for us as, as leaders and the young people too as we meet together and look at, uh, look at Romans together. Um, and a date for your diary, on the uh, 7th of February, which is a Sunday, um, we're going to be having our Morecambe Bay uh, partnership uh, prayer tea um, on Zoom. So that's a chance to meet and gather with other churches that we partner with in our area uh, and encourage one another, find out about what they've been doing uh, and pray for one another too. So um, that'd be something great to go to. And so do keep that in your diary. Um, pray too as well for us as elders. Um, we're going to be continuing to review uh, meeting in person this week during the lockdown. Um, so do be praying for, for wisdom um, and decision making in that um, yeah, as, as we meet this week. Uh, and two, as we leave uh, this morning, if I can encourage you as well just to uh, not, not gather and linger outside. Um, I know it's difficult to do, but kind of especially during these times, we can just sort of um, wait till we get on Zoom um, as we get home. Uh, so do, do join us for that too. Um, it's about half past 11, or when you get home, log in onto Zoom. If you haven't got the link, do let us know. We can get that to you, uh, and we can chat and have tea and coffee uh, and continue with fellowship together there. I think that's everything. Great. Well, as we uh, close, uh, let, we, let us pray together with the, with the words on the screen. So, Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your Spirit and the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.